Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paulette Smith, and I'm going to be introducing our next presenter. This is session number 302, The Joy of Forgiveness, Commanding, Not Demanding Joy. Our presenter for this afternoon is Paul Brogan. He is a Catholic marriage and family therapist in Encino. He also teaches in the psychology department at Mount St. Mary's College in Los Angeles. He teaches classes on loss and grief, trauma, alcohol and substance abuse, bullying and truancy, and spousal abuse. Originally from Ireland, he has completed graduate studies in theology and psychology, and he regularly presents at local schools and parishes. Please join me in welcoming Paul. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to our presentation on forgiveness. And good to see you all here. It's, it's that little bit harder after lunch to come, isn't it? So, <laughs> but it's good that you're here. So for the next hour and a half, we'll be looking at forgiveness as what it is and what it's not. And we'll be focusing a lot on what happens to us when we hold on, when we choose not to forgive and when we choose to forgive, how forgiveness is a choice. So as Paul says, my name is Paul Brogan, and um, one of the focuses that I work on the most with people is trying to get over old traumas and old wounds. So we're going to jump straight into it, and we're going to look at how God has created us with a wonderful brain that can be used to set us free or can be used to imprison us even more. So we're going to jump right into looking at the brain. So I want you all just to close your fist like this, like this. Now. Just close it. Don't raise it at anyone. Just close it. <laughs> Keep it to yourselves. <laughs> so we close our fists. So we're going to look a little bit at the brain. So the closed fist symbolizes a brain in a sense. The front area out here is like the neocortex, frontal cortex area. That's like the university of our brain where we have wonderful big ideas. Ideas of love, compassion, ideas uh, regarding strategizing, future planning, great conversations, long-term thinking. In here in the center brain, we have more our reptilian brain, our limbic system. And in the middle of the limbic system, we have a few things that we're going to look at. We have our hippocampus, which is like a filing cabinet, which remembers all of the experiences that we've ever had. So the limbic system is much more primitive than the frontal cortex, neocortex unit. But inside of that, there's another little thing called the amygdala. And you spell the amygdala by A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A -A. So let's spell that together. A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A. So let's pronounce it. It's the amygdala. And it's in which system? The limbic system, the primitive reptilian brain. So to give you an example as to what happens is that every piece of information that comes in through my eyes and ears, nose, mouth, and skin goes firstly into the primitive brain, into the limbic system, and then into the university, into the frontal cortex. So for example, um, if I'm hearing something that is wonderful and exciting, that is processed quickly, and I move into the frontal cortex. If the amygdala experiences something that is registering as a threat, all of a sudden, my sympathetic nervous system begins to be aroused. So I turn into a fight and flight machine, and I just want to leave the building. Let me give you an example. Um, as you know, I'm from Ireland. Ireland. I'm from Ireland. So we're going to imagine that I was attacked by a dog when I was five. It didn't happen, but let's imagine. So I look outside and I see a dog. 27th of a second, that information is processed in through my brain and the amygdala recognizes the dog, goes into the limbic system and all of a sudden, all of those experiences of attack are remembered. So what happens is, it's like the limbic system sort of lights up in a sense. It doesn't literally physically happen, but it's as if it lights up. It's like the university shuts down, and a big chemical transaction happens in my body. I start producing a lot of hormones that are going to protect me to get me away from the dog. 
The big chemicals I start producing are epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. So we talk about cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. Let's pronounce those together. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. So epinephrine and norepinephrine, sometimes we see it as a type of adrenaline, and then cortisol is produced in the medulla of the adrenal gland. So what happens to me when I start producing epinephrine and norepinephrine? Well, I go into like a panic-like attack. One of them starts my heart to go faster. Then another one of those chemicals gets my veins to constrict. So basically what's happening is all of the blood starts moving around the body to make me into like Superman to get me away from the dog. So all of a sudden bl blood goes from sort of the inner organs and from my brain into my fight muscles or my flight muscles. So oxygenated blood is rushing through my body to get me to run a mile from the dog or to attack the dog. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. That we call sympathetic arousal. Sympathetic arousal, fight or flight. So what do we call that? Sympathetic arousal. What are the hormones? Epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. So they're the three, three big hormones that are flooding through my body, and that's happening in less than a second. In fact, sometimes we say 27th of a second. It happens without me even knowing it. Same would be, for example, if you're driving down the 405, you're there minding your own business, you're listening to your favorite radio channel, and all of a sudden a truck pulls in front of you. In two seconds, you've already moved two or three lanes over before you actually say, what in God's name was that? Do you know how you move before you think? Or you're outside in the garden and a bird flies right by you, you move, then you think. So you act before you actually reflect on what's happening. So let's get back to the brain again. So I see the dog. Once again, it goes in the, all the information is processed in through my brain. The limbic system lights up, the amygdala is inflamed, and all of a sudden I'm in that fight or flight mode. So 27th of a second, I'm locked and loaded, and I just want to get out of there. So what are some of the symptoms of a panic attack? What happens to our bodies when we get anxious? What are some of the symptoms you're aware of? You're breathing, does it slow down or speed up? It goes much faster, well done. What else happens? What's that? You start sweating, absolutely. The body's trying to discharge all of these chemicals that you're carrying, so you start sweating. What else happens? You get frightened, you get frightened. absolutely. So there's a sense of fear. What else happens when you're in a panic attack? Your, your stomach constricts, absolutely. The body is trying to g eliminate everything you're carrying in your stomach to lighten the load so that you can run from the dog. To, <laughs> very good way to put it. So it's trying to lighten the load. In the same way, if you're carrying a purse and a bag and someone starts running after you, what do you do with the purse and a shopping bag? You drop them. Internally, you're doing the same as well, too. So the sum constricts for two reasons is that suddenly now all of these intestines are much more constricted because of the epinephrine and norepinephrine, and also the body has sensed a threat and wants to lighten the load. What else happens? So that's what we've talked about the stomach, we've talked about our breathing. What happens with my teeth? Yeah, teeth start clenching, so tighten jaws. Throat, does it widen or does it constrict? constricts, absolutely. What happens to my voice? Does it go up or does it go down? It goes up, absolutely, because now all of a sudden my throat is constricted and my tone increases. What else happens in a panic attack? Your heart rate is going, and you're, you're wanting to run more, you're wanting to get out of there much, much faster. So all of a sudden you're into this, you're into this locked and loaded um, you're sort of locked in the road and get ready to run from the dog. What happens to your pupils? Uh, pupils as in eyes. I know we're all in education here, but not, not pupils as in people you're teaching. But uh, what happens to your pupils? 
Dilate, absolutely, absolutely. And are you aware of everyone around you or are you aware just off the threat? Just off the threat. So you're locked and loaded with your eyes locked in and then you're ready to go and God help anyone in your way. So we're beautifully designed by that to constantly protect ourselves so that we, we keep our bodies safe and sacred. So any sort of threat, we are, we are designed to get out of there, like get out of the fire, get away from something so that we're going to be looked after. So we call that sympathetic arousal. That's the sympathetic nervous system. So I see the dog. So let's go back again here. So I see the dog. Suddenly, the limbic system is running the brain. It's like the university is shut down and I'm in the primitive part of the brain. It's like a bad alley in a bad part of town. So that's suddenly running everything for me. The university is shut down. I don't have any of those loftier thoughts of love and justice and fairness and kindness. I'm not into planning my future, thinking of people around me. I just want to get out of there. Sympathetic arousal, how quick does that, how long does that take? 27th of a second, I'm out of there. Then eventually what happens is the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in. So eventually, the hippocampus reminds me of other dogs that I have seen that haven't been dangerous. And it says, Paul, that's a security dog with a security man. You're in Alamany High School. You're fine. That was 40 years ago in your native Ireland. You will be fine, relax. And then my body starts to relax. So what happens to my breathing is, slows down. What happens to my pu dilated pupils? They relax, my throat loosens up, my voice lowers, and I go back into that uh, relaxed state. Now, 27th of a second for the sympathetic nervous system. For the parasympathetic nervous system, depending on the threat or on how many dogs that have bitten me, it might take me one second, five seconds, 10 seconds. So let's say if I've been bitten by 10 dogs, it might take me 10 seconds. 20 dogs, 20 seconds, so to speak. Just using that as an example. So in other words, the more experiences or traumas I have had, the more stuff that's in that filing cabinet. The more victim, you know, that vi sense of being victimized is relevant to me, the longer it's going to take me to calm down. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, for example, if I'm standing beside someone who's never been bitten by a dog, and I've been bitten by 20 dogs, that person may not understand me. They may not know what I'm going through because I'm suddenly locked and loaded and I'm out of there. So basically, what happens is we see the threat, we're beautifully designed to get out of there, but in the meanwhile, we're feeling very disconnected, very uninvolved, and very frightened. Only it is when the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in that we begin to relax and get back to the place of safety. So let's move into another part of the brain, which is called the orbital frontal cortex, right over your eyelids. So it's right there. It starts growing when, we're, uh, when we hit puberty and grows till about age 25. So it starts when puberty grows to about age 25. So as it's growing, as it's growing, I'm learning to take on such concepts as fairness, justice, love, um, all of these wonderful, more advanced concepts, faith, forgiveness, joy, which is our theme today, peace, humanity, understanding, all of those bigger concepts exist in that orbital, or the, the orbital frontal cortex. That's like the CEO of the brain. That's like the head honcho who understands everything. So it starts when I'm about age, um, you know, puberty 12, 13, keeps growing till I'm age 25. Now, after age 25, the brain is fully formed. That's why it's often easier for older people to forgive more or understand the concepts of justice, understand the concept of fairness, because their brain now is able to entertain that idea. Up to that point, it's much more difficult. Let's say, for example, we're in this wonderful high school here, Alamany High School. 
Let's look at the corridor outside and let's put two 15-year-old boys. They're walking down the corridor and they bump into each other, just like that. Big bump into each other. Two 15-year-old boys. What are these two boys likely to say to each other? I know you can't say it, absolutely, and we're being recorded, so no bad words. But what are they likely to say? Get out of my way. Hey, man. What were you thinking? What's wrong with you? Absolutely. All right. So in other words, it's personal. You know, they're not thinking in an advanced manner. It's personal. Up to age 25, everything is personal. You're doing that to me. Up to age 25. Um, let's put two faculty members from Alamany, from, let's take even from the, religious, from the religion department. Two religion teachers bump into each other. Let's say they're in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. They bump into each other. So bump, same type of bump. What are the teachers likely to say? Sorry. Excuse me, I'm sorry. What else might they say? Pardon me. I didn't see you. It's my fault. Absolutely. Now, that's not just because they're in the religion department. That's just because they're older, and it is also not personal. So after up to age 25, it's personal. You're doing that to me. After age 25, it's more, you just bumped into someone. <laughs> it happened to be me, but it's not personal. That's why insurance companies keeps the, keep the rates very, very high until about age 25. They know well that two 20, you have two 21-year-olds on the 405, one cuts one off, what is the other likely to do? Do the same thing, run after them. Two older people, post-25, two 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, someone cuts you off, what are you likely to do? Let them go. Absolutely, absolutely. So you tend to let them go and pull away from them. That's why rates drop when we are over 25. The insurance company tracks brain development. So, so let's get back into that again. So we have the brain, we have the limbic system, we have the neocortex, frontal cortex region, the university, which relates to this part out here. We talked about the orbital frontal cortex over the left eyelids, which starts around age 12 and grows to age 25. So, a concept such as forgiveness exists only in the orbital frontal cortex. It does not exist in the limbic system. In the limbic system, everything is a threat. So forgiveness becomes a choice. Forgiveness becomes a choice to take the experience I've had and process it differently. So let's say, for example, let's say, let, I was going to say, let's say this is a microphone. Let's say this is a microphone, but it actually is a microphone. So let's say it's my microphone and someone, t what's your first name? Jesse. And Jesse steals the microphone. So, so I love this microphone. My grandmother gave it to me for my 40th birthday, let's say, and it's very personal to me. And in comes Jesse and steals my microphone. So I'm not feeling good about that happening. So before that, Jesse and I were friends. We were like that. We were equal. So then Jesse steals my microphone. So now I'm feeling like a victim. And my feeling is anger. Anger is the pure feeling of a victim. If I feel something has been done to me and I'm victimized, my emotion is usually that of anger. So Jesse wants the microphone, but I want two things. I want, what do I want? I want the microphone and I want to punish Jesse. Jesse wants one thing. You want the, the mic. But I now, as the victim, I want two things. I want the microphone back, and I want to punish Jesse. So let's say, and your first name? Emanuela. Emanuela. So let's say this is my chair. Emanuela wants the chair. So Emanuela and I are equal. Now she comes in and takes my chair. So now I'm seeing myself as the victim. So I want, Emanuela just wants the chair. The chair. It's beautiful. Who, it's beautiful plastic. Who wouldn't want a fine-looking chair like this? 
So she wants the chair. Now, I want two things. Once again, I want the chair. And number two, I want, I want to punish Emmanuel for taking it. So that's where I go into the area of anger. So we're going to talk a little bit about anger right now. So let's say I'm angry at Jessie. What's happening to me now as I've perceived her as a threat? What's happening? What hormones am I producing? Epinephrine, cortisol, and norepinephrine. Think of epinephrine and her sister Nora. Epinephrine and norepinephrine and cortisol. So now that I'm angry, what else is happening to me? My chest is tightening, pupils dilating. What else is happening? Blood pressure is going through the roof. What else is happening? My breathing is changing. I'm speeding up. What else is going on? My voice is getting higher. What about my teeth? Clenching, absolutely. What's happening to my skin? Sweating, absolutely. So I'm now angry, so there's a physiological change that's happening. So my body is now flooded with cortisol. I'm mad. So now my body is flooded with cortisol. So I'm feeling, so anger sometimes sort of feels very real because of that chemical transformation that happens. And remember, as we said, it happens in less than a second. I'm locked and loaded and I'm fighting. So suddenly all of these hormones are racing through my body and I don't know what's going on. But am I more, so Jesse just wants the microphone, am I more dangerous than she is or what? Absolutely. Because I'm now angry and I'm perceiving myself as a victim, I'm now more dangerous than she is. So anger is the pure emotion of a victim, and if I'm feeling victimized, I'm the one that needs to be watched. She just wants one thing, the mic. The mic. I want two things, the mic plus punishment, punishment plus revenge. Now, as I'm feeling angry, I'm flooded with all of these hormones. And even if I get the mic back, all of these hormones linger in the body. We think on average for about four hours. For about four hours, they're still in the system. So they've run through the bloodstream, so they're still lingering there. So I'm not setting myself up for success. One of the problems with cortisol is that it's a very dangerous drug. It calcifies in the intestine. You know, it's very, very dangerous for us to have high levels of cortisol. So I have all of these hormones rushing around my body. So let's say now, you know, um, Jesse took the mic at 4 o'clock. Emmanuel took the, the chair at 4.05. Once again, it's a repetitive gesture. So all of these drugs in my body are compounding. Does that make sense? Yes. So event after event after event is I'm getting locked and loaded and I'm getting pumped up. And these things are lingering and lingering and lingering, calcifying my intestines, shortening my lifespan essentially. Shortening my lifespan. But that's because I've told myself the story that I'm angry, she's done that to me, and I'm choosing to not forgive her. I'm saying it's wrong, I want it back, and I will get it back. So I'm setting myself up for failure and for a shorter life. Cortisol is so dangerous for us. It's that stress hormone that sends us to an early grave. So I have to make a choice then. I have to choose to hold on to it, hold on to the anger, or to make a choice to let it go. Now, the danger with holding on to anger is that my feelings get me to say my feelings get me to say things over and over again, that I am a victim, or you stole from me, or you are bad, or poor me. So as I start expressing that feeling over and over again, or that statement to myself that I am a victim, I start creating these new neural pathways in my brain. And I start traveling up and down these neural pathways over and over again by seeing myself as a victim, so that even if I'm forgiven, or even if I get the mic back, I still feel victimized. Does that make sense? So in other words, when we have a thought in our brain, it's like we create a groove or a, a grain in the brain. It's like we call them neural pathways. 
So as we travel up and down that same thought over and over again, it's like the groove just deepens. It's like if you walk across the grass here on the lawn and you press down on the grass, then someone else walks after you, presses down on the grass, then 10 people walk across. You know how that grass suddenly becomes like a, a mud pathway, then eventually it becomes like the 405. Does that make sense? By going over it and over it and over it and over it, suddenly it feels and looks real. So the same way with the story I'm telling myself about being victimized can set me up for failure. It's repeating the same thing. It's also creating like a muscle memory in my brain and actually damaging me. So we talk about fe my feelings become my thoughts and my thoughts become my actions. So we go F-T-A. So what happens to my feelings? My feelings become what? Thoughts. What happens to thoughts? Thought becomes actions. So what happens to me as I'm remembering all of those cases of being victimized, in other words, I'm feeling angry. Then my thought is, or I'm fe let's say I'm feeling victimized. Jesse took the mic. I'm feeling victimized. That morphs into a thought that I am victimized, and then I'm likely to go out and act on that, seek revenge. Another example of that, let's say, um, let's say I'm studying math here, let's say, and I feel stupid because I'm no good at math, and actually I am no good at math, but I always struggled a little bit at math, but let's say the feeling would be, I feel stupid. That morphs into a thought that I am stupid, and then that morphs into an action that I don't study. Then I don't study, I get bad grades, and then I'm back to the feeling again. Does that make sense? So if I'm allowing myself to have these feelings of anger and rage and hold on and not forgive or not let go, I'm actually setting myself up for danger. So what happens to my feelings? My feelings become thoughts, and thoughts become actions. And the actions usually reinforce that feeling over and over again. So I'm creating, like we call it a trauma-laden narrative for myself, a trauma-laden story. A tra you, know, you stole my chair, you stole my mic, I've ha I have a bad life, everybody's out to get me. <laughs> so I create a trauma-laden story. Now, what happens then with my trauma-laden story? Are you still all on board? Yes. You getting this? Let's take that story. Okay, so I came to Alamany, someone stole my chair, and someone stole my mic. What happens to that story is I'm telling it over and over again. As we said, with muscle memory, repetition is the mother of learning. So as I'm hearing it over and over again, I'm beginning to relive it. And then we come up with the concept. So then let's say, you know, I'm, you know in a month or two, I'm telling that to other people as well. And in a year from now, I'm telling the same story. What happens is that every time I tell the story, the amygdala inflames and acts as if it's happening right now. It's like time travel. Remember, I saw the dog outside. I'd been bitten 40 years ago. And all of a sudden, I'm back in my native Ireland being bitten by a dog. So all of those hormones once again start coursing through my body. And those hormones are? epinephrine and cortisol. So that's where we get the idea of resentment, resentare. I'm resenting something. As I'm resenting something that happened to me 40 years ago, my primitive brain believes that it's happening all over again and produces the hormones accordingly. So I might be sitting here in alumni on the 20th of September, is it 20th? 20th, yeah, 20th of September. And I might have been bitten by a dog 40 years ago, but it's like as this is happening all over again. The same old neural pathways are, are lighting up. Same chemicals are going on all over again. So that's where the word resentment comes from. I'm refeeling it. I'm refeeling it, I'm reliving it, and I'm setting myself up for disaster. It would be 
Um, have you ever been driving and you've heard a song that you haven't heard maybe in 20 or 30 years? So you're just driving on the 405 and ABBA comes on. And they're singing, oh, dancing queen. I said, my gosh, you're singing the song before you say, you know what? I haven't heard that song in 20 years. Have you ever had that experience? You're singing the song and then you go, you know, I haven't heard that song since my eighth grade, since my first communion, since my first marriage, since my first, you know, do you know how you go back in time? So you're singing the song and you remember it word for word before you actually then realize that you've done like time travel. Does that make sense? The same with the stories, the same with the victimized stories. The dog bit me, the dog did me wrong. I was wounded by the dog. It's happening all over again as I remember it because it's a response from the primitive brain. So what do we do then? Well, we have to watch what we're doing with our stories. We have to watch how trauma-laden our stories are. And sometimes, our, sometimes we've had horrible things happen to us. Sometimes horrible things have happened to us, but the danger is if we don't change the way we see them or understand them, we will relive them all over again. Now, to give you, um, to give you a good example, I had my own experience. When I was back in Ireland, I, was, uh, I took a degree in history. And Ireland has, uh, we have a long history. Lots of invasions, Vikings, Normans, English, and all of that sort of stuff. So our history teachers were always careful to say that when you're teaching history, don't create modern-day terrorists. When you're talking about wars and invasions and all of that, understand that the, the brain of the children that you're teaching to may not be able to figure out, hang on, that happened 500 years ago, that happened 400 years ago. That if you're talking about Vikings coming from Norway and plundering monasteries and stealing all of these things, you know, be careful because the child might look at their first Norwegian, go out and beat them up. Does that make sense? So in other words, as history teachers, that was part of the dance. How do you share and talk about what happened historically and not inflame your listeners? How do you talk about invasions and all of that, especially back in Ireland when I was studying in the 80s, lots of struggles with terrorism and all of that. So it was like, how do you not create a new wave amongst our younger people of terrorists, of young terrorists, who are reacting to something that happened three or 400 years ago? So just as much then as history teachers have to watch how they teach, so too I have to watch how I share, number one with myself and number two with those around me. Does that make sense? Because I might be comfortable with the story, but I don't know what the story is doing for them. I don't know what it's doing for the listener. Now, we're going to look at um, uh, this wonderful thing called Cartman's Triangle. Cartman's Triangle, Steve Cartman, K-A-R-P-M-A-N. Let's spell that. K-A-R-P-M-A-N, Cartman's Triangle. So in Steve Cartman's Triangle, when someone presents themselves as a victim, suddenly two other characters get involved. One is the rescuer and one is the aggressor. So for example, if I go and tell you I said, you know, I went to Alimony this morning with my favorite mic that I got from my grandmother on my 40th birthday last year, I wish. <laughs> so, so I'm telling you this wonderful story. And then I'm saying, Jesse came in and she stole that. She came right up, she took the mic and off she was. She jumped in her car and was gone. And this was the mic I got from my grandmother, and I loved it. It reminded me of my grandmother. So she stole the mic. Jesse stole the mic. So I'm telling you this story. How would you start feeling towards Jesse? Angry, absolutely. 
What else might come up? Or what else, how might you feel angry? What else would you feel towards Jesse? Disgusted, suspicious, Res you would resent her? Absolutely. There you go. We'd want to go out and attack, wouldn't we? Yeah. Now, so what would you do for me now? Here I am without the mic that my grandmother gave me for my 40th birthday. I'm lost, desolate, and crying without the mic. What would you want to do for me? Console me. What else would you want to do? Sympathize. Sympathize. Paul, you poor thing. God love you. You poor thing. So you console me. What else might you do? I don't have a mic anymore. Protect me. You might even want to go and buy me a mic at the mic store. You know? So in other words, because I've presented myself as a victim, those two characters in Cartman's Triangle have suddenly appeared. And those characters are aggressor and rescuer. So we have those three characters in the triangle. We have victim, aggressor, rescuer. So in that story, who is the victim? I am. Who is the aggressor? Voila, Jesse. And the rescuers are? All of you. Absolutely. So remember, once again, I'm feeling victimized. The emotion of a victim is anger. And I'm relaying the story to you of that of being victimized. Now, change the story. So I come here to Alimony with my microphone that my grandmother gave me for my 40th birthday last year, I wish. And Jesse comes up and steals it. So I'm telling you the story. You know, I came in and Jesse took the microphone, but you know what? It was an old microphone. I have great insurance. She must really need one. And, you know, she's welcome to it. You know, because I've had it for a couple of years. And I'm going to upgrade anyway. And, you know, my insurance covers it 100%. So tomorrow I'm going to go to the mic store myself and buy the latest microphone with all the latest bells and whistles. So it actually was a blessing in disguise. And I'm off to the microphone, at the mic store, and I invite you to come along. Okay. Now, in that story, is there, do we have the triangle? No. Am I a victim in that story? No. I've changed the story. Do we have an aggressor? Are you feeling disgusted, shocked, and horrified? No. Do you want to beat Jesse up? No. Absolutely. Ab absolutely. You're safe. So because I changed the story and how I looked at it, I did not set you up for failure. I did not set myself up for failure. And I actually changed the story. So I moved into the realm of forgiveness. So forgiveness many times is choosing not to go there. It is a choice in how I tell the story. Do I tell it as a victim or do I tell it as a victor? Do I tell it as, you know, do I talk about the wound or do I talk about my wisdom? The wisdom of saying, I have good insurance, let me get another one, and you know, I'm going to be fine. So we talk about the, the call to forgiveness is to move from wounds to wisdom. Moving from wounds to wisdom. We acknowledge the wounds, absolutely. I didn't say it didn't happen. But I chose it in such a way that I would live, and Jesse would live, and that I wouldn't be putting this on you. And whose choice was it? My choice. I had no choice over the microphone being handled or being taken, but I had a choice over how I presented it to you. Because I will pull you all in on the story. And that's many times what happens is that we can, in relaying our story, suddenly put those we love in this very difficult position of having to rescue us. And then the anger goes all over the place. Then suddenly the whole village is in an uproar. And everybody who's ever had a microphone stolen is suddenly involved. They're identifying themselves. Everybody who's ever had anything stolen from them is now already feeling victimized once again because they're remembering all their own events. Does that make sense? It's the same way as you go to a funeral, you're remembering every funeral you've been at. You go to a wedding, you're remembering every wedding you've been at. 
So in the same way, I have the choice. Do I bring everybody in or do I set you all free? Now, we have to look at the benefits of not seeking forgiveness. So let's say everybody is, you're all so sad for me. You're saying, Paul, come on, we'll buy you coffee. We'll buy you a microphone. Come here and talk to us. I might like that. You're all buying me coffee, reaching out to me. You know, that might be good. And the danger is I might be getting, we call it a secondary gain from that story. So I'm feeling victimized, but everyone's buying me coffee. I lost a mic, but I, I gained sympathy, consolation. You're writing me cards. You're taking up collection for a microphone. So I'll have to be honest with myself that if I'm keeping that story alive, there might be a secondary gain for me. There might be a secondary benefit to the story. And that's why we always have to watch our stories. That many times we might feel victimized, we don't want to forgive, there must be something better for me. It must be paying off. So I have to ask myself, how am I benefiting by not seeking forgiveness? Because if I'm not seeking forgiveness, there obviously is a benefit. What am I winning? How am I winning by not letting go of the story? Because who wants to have that feeling over and over and over again? Who needs that cortisol? Who needs that epinephrine and that norepinephrine? It's destructive. It gets us nowhere. So basically, as we see, I had option one, option two. I had the option to create the triangle or not create the triangle. I had the option to be wounded or the option to be wise. I had the option to, to move on or the option to get stuck. Now, when we're talking about victims here, once again, we're not talking about victims of crime or war victims or where people, you know, had no control over the situation, you know. So we're not talking about victims of sexual abuse, victims of violence, n natural disasters. We're talking about the typical interaction in our daily lives. Does that make sense? So we're talking about victimization in that sense, just as a point of reference there. So how do I change the story? Well, number one, I go back and I have to realize that there is a benefit in it for me when I change the story. And there's many, many ways of doing that. I, in a sense, rewrite history. I go back to the wound. I acknowledge it. The mic was stolen. I bow to it but I'm not bound by it. I said, yes, it did happen. Yes, it was bad. It was my favorite mic given to me by my grandmother from my native on my 40th birthday. I acknowledge it, but I'm not bound by it. And there's some wonderful techniques to help us get over that. So, for example, I would acknowledge Jesse stole my microphone, and I would bridge it into success. Like, I would say, Jesse stole my microphone, but luckily, I had insurance. Jesse stole my microphone, but luckily, I was tired of it anyway. The dog bit me, but luckily, I've learned to stay away from stray dogs. My car was stolen, but through the grace of God, I was able to buy a new one because I had good insurance. So we take the trauma and we add on the but luckily, or with the help of God, the grace of God, and then we move into the wisdom. Does that make sense? So I move into the new story, which is now present. It's like with children's stories. You know, what is always at the end of a child's story? Cinderella. They all, and they all lived happily ever after. We'll all see a trauma, but then something wonderful happens. 
I mean, could you imagine with children's story, like if um, Cinderella, if the clock just went 12 and that was the end, you know, the, she never dropped her slipper, you know? So she went to the ball, Prince saw her, that was it. She was too late. I mean, we wouldn't tell that story to kids, would we? Because they'd go to bed very upset. You know, or who, uh, Snow White ate the poison apple. Could you imagine if the prince didn't come by and saved her? You know, the kids would go to bed traumatized about someone, someone died after eating an apple. How horrible. <laughs> that wouldn't have become a, chi you know, a story we'd tell kids. There's always that happily ever after. So we acknowledge something bad that happened, but we change the ending. We see that in our Psalms. You know, Psalms are great places to go. We have 150 Psalms. We see that, at the, you know, in some of the Psalms, is God, you have abandoned me. My life is horrible. All of these things have happened, but I trust in your goodness. But I know you are there. So we see that running through the Psalms as well. The acknowledge of the wound, and the move to the wisdom. So forgiveness is really that choice, which I have to move from wound to wisdom, so that I focus on the benefits of letting go, so that I'm not living, resenting over and over again, and having that cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine flooding through my veins every time I see a dog. Does that make sense? So moving from wounds to wisdom. Now, how are we doing for time? I don't know. Quarters and three. Quarters and three. OK, we're good. OK. So it's moving from wounds to wisdom. So many times, what we can do is just go back and list those things that have happened and bridge them with, but luckily, but through the grace of God, I was able to get out of there. Now, in my last class, some of you were there, we were talking about um, we're looking at the 12-step program on understanding alcohol and substance abuse. We looked at the concept in the 12-step program that talks about my experience, my strength, and my hope. So in other words, if you're attending an AA meeting or a Narcotics Anonymous meeting, you talk about your experience, but also that's only the first 33%. You have to go, so let's say if I'm saying I'm an alcoholic, then I have to focus on my strengths and I have to focus on my hopes. I can't just say, I can't just talk about the trauma of alcohol or drug addiction. Does that make sense? Otherwise, I'm re-traumatizing myself and traumatizing everyone listening to me. So in the 12-step program, they have a wonderful concept of experience, strength, and hope. And that's a wonderful concept for forgiveness. So I talk about my experience. Then I move to my strength, and I move to my hope. And as I'm doing that, I'm engaging different parts of the brain. My experience, limbic system, primitive hippocampus, amygdala inflaming. Then strength, I'm moving into my university out here. And hope, I'm staying in the university. Does that make sense? So I'm not staying in that bad alley in a bad part of town. I'm actually transforming transforming the pain into something good. So let's say um, something bad happened. Let's say I was in a car crash. Let's say I was in a car crash, and so I would talk about the car crash. I was in a car crash in 1999. My, that was my experience. My strength was my family were there for me and good nurses and good doctors. My hope is it will never happen to me again. Once I move into those two components, I am more likely to constantly forgive people. I'm more likely to constantly stay in the present. If I'm staying in the past, I'm reliving it as if it is the present, but I'm also setting myself up for failure. So what are those three things? Experience, strength, and hope. Experience, strength, and hope. So it is a choice. So I have to go back and constantly say, I don't want to go there. I can't afford to not forgive. So getting back to forgiveness again, and these are things we already know. That let's say Jesse stole the mic. Now, my desire for forgiveness doesn't mean I'm going to forget that Jesse stole the mic, correct? correct. It doesn't mean that Jesse feels bad 
about stealing the mic or is going to seek forgiveness. It doesn't mean that she feels anything about the mic. My desire for forgiveness is basically my desire to not, not slowly send myself to an early grave. I can't afford that sympathetic arousal. I can't afford to be constantly angry. I can't afford to constantly have dilated pupils, increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, compromised digestive system. I can't afford that. That is just too dangerous. What happens when I have that sympathetic arousal is three big systems in the body are compromised. The first one is my digestive system. Second one is the reproductive system. Third one is the immune system. Digestive, reproductive, and immune system. Basically what's happening, as we said, blood moves from those areas into the fight or flight muscles. So many times we see people presenting with problems such as maybe obesity. They can't digest properly. Their metabolism is compromised because they're constantly in that aroused state. They're not, the body isn't able to break down and process the food just because they're in that state of constant arousal. And it's very dangerous, for example, reproduction-wise, if, if a woman is pregnant and carrying a child. Very, very dangerous. The immune system is compromised. I'm likely to catch any flu that's out there or any infection that's out there just because I'm now so hypervigilant and hyper-aroused. In fact, many people say about 9-11 that more people died of compromised immune systems in reaction to 9-11 that were actually killed in the Twin Towers. That constant fear of being attacked again. That constant fear of something bad coming, coming to pass. Waiting and watching for another assault. Hypervigilance is really very dangerous for us. How do we become hypervigilant? Well, we said we see, we hear, we feel, and we react. So, even the way, so we looked at the story of victimization. Then I have to start watching my words. For example, if I go into a bank and I say to the uh, bank manager, I don't have a gun and I'm not going to rob the bank. What's going to happen? They're going to call security, absolutely. But I'm saying I don't have a gun. And I'm not going to rob the bank. What did they hear? Gun and bank. I go to Burbank Airport. I'm flying to San Jose. I say I don't have a bomb and I'm not a terrorist. What are they going to say? Oh, that's, are they going to say, oh, that's wonderful. That's nice of you. What are they going to do? Absolutely. The airport will go in, shut down mode. Even though I'm saying I'm not a terrorist and I don't have a bomb, automatically they hear bomb and terrorists. Absolutely. So the primitive brain does not do grammar. The primitive brain does not do grammar. So even with people around you, with people you love, if you were to, would you say to a little child, you're very beautiful or you're not ugly? You, absolutely. If you say to a little child, you're not ugly, they hear ugly. Absolutely. So with little children, we have it right. Most of the time, most, you know. So it's the same way that we have to watch our words ourselves. So even if I say I don't hate someone, those around me hear the word hate. hate. So there are lots of inflammatory words that we really have to start watching how we talk. Because I might be saying, well, I forgive Jesse for stealing the mic. People are hearing stealing. So I have to watch my, I have to know my audience. 
Are they ready to hear this? Are my words inflammatory? Am I setting these people up for failure? Now, not only words, but my tone of voice. If I run into the bank and I say, I love you all, and I'm shouting at them, what are they going to do? They call security. Even if I'm shouting, I love you, but I have a raised voice, how are they going to experience that? A threat. A threat. So even a raised voice with some beautiful wish, Valentine's Day wish, is going to be sensed as a threat. So once again, we watch that as well. So tone of voice, body posture, words I use, the speed of my voice, if I'm talking rapidly, that's often perceived as a threat as well. So the key there is in forgiveness, that number, I start going, we call it slow and low. I start speaking slowly about my experience, strength and hope, and I do it in a low tone. Does that make sense? And low in all sense, you know, the low body language. In other words, I'm not pumped up, wrapped up, I'm not wound up. Because if I'm wound up, if my amygdala is inflamed, it will inflame the amygdala of other people. We talk about free-floating anxiety. If I'm anxious about something, then that's going to transmit to other people. Doesn't that make sense? It's like listening to the radio. You're driving in and you're listening to, we say, CNN, constant negative news. You know, we're, we're listening to the negativity and news that does impact us. So the anxiety that we see or that we hear on the radio station, that does impact us. All these stories about, you know, about wars and diseases and all those things we can't control as we're driving on the 405, the brain registers them. So we do have that chemical reaction even though there's nothing we can do about them. So sometimes, even in forgiveness, that's why we, we turn off a lot of those CNNs, constant negative news. And CNN could be a person. CNN could be a group of people I hang out with. CNN could be a negative, could be a negative faculty group that often the negativity comes out in the form of gossip or anger. Have you ever met anyone who gossiped? Never, huh? No. Many times that is anger sort of slowly, slowly releasing itself. We talk about like a frozen anger. In it, the story is going on and on and on and on about what happened, but it's very, very dangerous. So we make choices if we're really trying to forgive is that we pull away from the population that's reinforcing the feelings that we want to get rid of. Let's go back to feelings. What did we say with my feelings? My feelings become thoughts. Thoughts, thoughts become actions. Example of that is, I, let's say my granny doesn't send me a mic for Christmas, so I feel unloved. That morphs into a thought because I'm feeling it over and over again and I'm sharing it over and over again, that morphs into a thought that I am unloved and then what happens, what sort of action, then I don't visit granny and then she never sees me so I never get the mic so I just reinforce the feeling in the first place. So we talk about the trauma narrative I keep feeding, the monster I keep feeling. So once I move to that place of forgiveness, we can see how so much of this goes away. We see that forgiveness is a choice to live longer, and forgiveness is something I do for myself because I can't afford the feelings. I can't afford the feelings of carrying on the anger. I can't afford this rush of, uh, rush of these neurotransmitters, epinephrine, norepinephrine and cortisol every time I think of the event. I can't afford doing this constant time travel every time the topic is brought up. However, if I've changed the story, 
and I have added those bridges, and we looked at some examples. What are the bridges? Jesse stole my mic, but luckily, very good, I bought a new one. Jesse stole my mic, but through the grace of God, I had insurance. The more, I've to more and more I've told those stories, a lot, of this, a lot of these experiences of trauma just go back into the hippocampus changed. They're no longer inflammatory. I'm acknowledging, I'm bowing to them, acknowledging that they happened, but I'm not bound by them anymore. So I'm setting myself up to let go so that everyone can live a better life around me. Okay. How are we doing time-wise? Three o'clock. All right. Okay. Wonderful. So I want to, we're just going to do a little exercise as to how I actually calm down when that sympathetic nervous system is aroused. So we're just going to do a little exercise and it's going to bring us down um, it's going to calm us down. It's one of the fastest ways to calm myself down, all right? So I want you all to put your feet on the ground. Okay, both feet on the ground. Put your notebooks down and just sort of shake your hands out a little bit. Okay. Both feet firmly on the ground, back up against the chair. Okay. Then you can go ahead and rest your hands on your knees on your own knees. <laughs> and then if you feel comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes. And we're going to do some deep breathing. And I want you to breathe in through your nose, all the way in. We're going to make our bellies big, so let's breathe in together. Inhale, all the way in, hold. Then five, four, three, two, one, exhale. Then we're going to breathe again, all the way in through our nose, all the way in, making our bellies big. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Exhale. We're going to breathe in again, all the way in through our nose, making our bellies big. Hold the oxygen, hold the oxygen. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, exhale. And one more time, we're going to breathe all the way in, in through our nose, making our bellies big. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, exhale. And now with your eyes still closed, I want you to become aware of your feet in your shoes and just tighten your feet and relax them. So just tighten them or squeeze your feet and relax. And we're going to move up to the calves of your legs. We're going to tighten, tighten, tighten and relax. And then we're going to move up to our thighs. We're going to tighten, 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 and relax. We're going to move up into our stomach. We're going to pull our stomachs in all the way in. Tighten, 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 and relax. Then we're going to move up to our neck. We're going to tighten our neck, tighten it up, tighten, tighten, and relax. Then we're going to move down our elbows all the way down to the tips of our fingers and we're going to make a fist and tighten our hands, tighten, 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 and relax. And then we're going to move all the way up, all the way up through our sh elbows and shoulders. And now we're going to go back up to our neck again, tighten it up, 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 and relax. And then we're going to move up to our facial muscles. We're going to tighten, don't worry, no one can see you. Tighten, 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 tighten and relax. And then we're going to take a deep breath in, all the way in through our nose, making our bellies big. Hold, six, five, four, three, two, one, exhale. We're going to do it again, in through our nose, making our bellies big. Hold, seven, six, Five, four, three, two, one, exhale. 
And one more time, we're going to breathe in, all the way in through our nose, making our bellies big. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, relax. And now go ahead and open your eyes. And just sort of shake yourself out a little bit. And how do you feel? Relaxed, absolutely. Now, what we've done there is we've done two things. Well, we've done a few things, but the two big things is we've done deep breathing. The fastest way to trigger in the parasympathetic, remember we said, which is the calming system, is by deep breathing. Deep breathing is my way to tell the brain that there's, even though I imagined a threat, the threat is not actually real. Even though I perceived a threat, I am safe. So when I start deep breathing, I'm sending signals to my brain that I'm actually safe and that all is well. Does that make sense? So I start there, start with the deep breathing, and I slow down my body. The important thing is I exhale slowly, not quickly. Because if I exhale quickly, I could be sending a trigger to my brain that things are not well. We also then move down to what we call progressive muscle relaxation. Progressive muscle relaxation. So it's progressive, it's about the muscles, and the goal is relaxation. Remember we said when we have sympathetic arousal, Blood goes from the small muscles into the big muscles. The fight muscles are the flight muscles to get me up to run or attack. So in other words, when we're, when we're fired up, the extremities of our body, the blood has gone from there. So by having that progressive muscle relaxation, in a sense, we're rebalancing the body again. Does that make sense? So we're bringing the, body, bringing the blood back all over the body again. So it's a very good tool anytime I'm feeling angry, anytime I'm feeling upset or I don't want to forgive, to just take myself out and start something like that. I may not be able to do deep breathing. Maybe I'm in the workplace or there's people looking at me, but I can certainly do the, you know, the progressive muscle relaxation, if not alone, just with my feet that alone will start me thinking differently. That alone will slow down my heart rate, slow down my breathing, and then get me into that more advanced part of the brain, the neocortex, the frontal cortex region, which is the university of my brain. Because in there is my capacity to understand and therefore my capacity to forgive. When I'm not forgiving, it's like the limbic system is shut down and is running the university. When I'm forgiving, all of a sudden, the university is open because now I'm looking at options. I'm weighing things up. I'm feeling better about myself. So if I'm focusing on Jesse has stole the, has stole the mic, my brain is like a closed fist. Once I start forgiving, I'm saying, well, hang on, it was an old mic. Hang on, I have insurance. Hang on, it was time to buy a new one. So I'm actively using my skills to reason, to plan, and also allowing myself think of another way of handling it. So we're moving from sort of that closed heart into that more open mind. We talk about moving from paranoia, that fear that is going to happen again, into metanoia, that desire to change. Metanoia, that change of heart. Well, listen, we'll start to bring our time to a close for today. Um, we're going to just do a quick review of everything we have learned. So, limbic system, which one is it? The primitive or advanced? It's the primitive. The advanced is the neocortex, the frontal cortex region, which is out here. How do you spell amygdala? Hey, Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A. The amygdala triggers the sympathetic nervous system. So when that's triggered, do I have an ability to forgive people? Absolutely not. So I have to get myself into that parasympathetic nervous system that's going to restore me into being able to reason. 
So what happens in the body when I start forgiving someone? What starts happening to my, my blood pressure? It goes down. What else happens? Heart rate decreases. Breathing decreases. The muscles relax. So I have that physical transformation. We looked at thoughts. What's the danger of some of my thoughts that my thoughts turn into actions? We go back a little bit. We start with my feelings. My feelings can morph into thoughts, and thoughts then become actions, and the danger is the actions reinforce. So as we were looking at forgiveness once again, we focused on the benefits of forgiveness to everyone around me, and that involves me telling the story. So what did we say with the past? Am I bound by it or do I bow to it? I bow to it. I acknowledge it. I don't deny it. But I'm not going to be bound by it. We looked at some ways of bridging the story, changing the story from wounds to wisdom, from trauma to triumph, from being a victor or victim to being a victor. We focused on Kaufman's triangle. How many characters are in it? Three. We have the victim, aggressor, and the rescuer. We looked at the concept of resentment. What happens when I'm resenting something that happened 40 years ago? What's happening in my brain? I'm reliving it. The same thing, same chemical, same neural pathway. It's happening all over again. I'm feeling it before I remember it actually happened. In the same way as you hear in an ABBA song, you're singing it before you realize, well, I haven't heard that for 20 or 30 years. So in our, in our uh, class today, we were just looking at the benefits of forgiveness, how they're good for the heart and good for the soul. We know in our faith tradition that it's good to forgive. And Jesus says, forgive how many times? 77 times 7. In other words, have life, live life, forgive over and over and over again. We forgive so that we may live. Forgiveness is about me not wanting to go to an early grave, not wanting to die young, but, being, but wanting to be able to live the life that God wants me to. St. Irenaeus said, the glory of God is humankind fully alive that God is glorified when we're fully alive. So when we are forgiving, we are living. So choosing to let go means that God's got us. All right, well, listen, we'll bring our time to a close today and very happy to have been available to you. And I hope you found our talk helpful today. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.